Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day five of the Business Exchange Southwest Charity Conference and Expo in partnership with Milstead Langdon Accountants and Stone King Law. I'm delighted to introduce onto the main stage this morning Kate Harper and Louise Carver of Resolution Space. We're going to be talking about that really important thing at the moment as we're all working um, in a hybrid way with um, an A team and a B team perhaps uh, taking it in turns to be in the office and a lot of virtual work going on. So today's session is on improving how your people work together in hybrid teams. Kate and Louise, the stage is yours. Thank you, ladies. Thank nice you, Anita. Um, thanks, Anita, and thank it's great to see everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to um, speak today, and thank you for joining us. Um, Resolution Space, um, Louise and I have been working together for a number of years now. We're both ex-military, both local to the, um, the Chippenham area, and um, have been working together now for about four years in learning and development. Um, uh, together and um, working with a variety of teams, both across the public, private and not-for-profit sector, both before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now as everybody's starting to emerge. So based on that and based on what we've seen, we really want to share with you some of the things that we're seeing um, in terms of people working together as they're emerging from the pandemic and the challenges they're facing and how they're overcoming those um, and how we've been helping helping them to overcome those um, those areas. So why do you need a high performing team? Well, I'm sure like every other business, every pound is hard earned and that's particularly true of the not-for-profit sector um, and you're looking to achieve the maximum amount of bang for your buck um, and, every, and the maximum effect from every pound that you've um, that you've earned so that nothing is wasted and particularly that money that you spend on um, in a supporting or an administrating um, function um, rather than directly to the cause and for spending time uh, spending money and time on dealing with conflict if things are starting to go wrong not to mention the diver diversion of management effort that's really a waste of the those hard-earned pounds therefore if you've got employees and volunteers who are unable to give a hundred percent then and you've got money being directed away from your main effort and your main cause so what we're trying to do is to help you as a, with a high performing team to make sure that all your resources are used to the maximum and are not wasted. And of course, any of you who have been involved in um, working in organisations where there is some conflict uh, going on, um, you may this may resonate with you. You may know that it's actually it's very costly in both human and financial terms. Um, not to resolve that conflict, not to get your teams working better together. You know, management, as Kate has said, management times diverted. Um, the average cost of going to an employment tribunal is around about ten thousand pounds. So um, it does make um, it makes absolute sense to get your teams working together better, so that you don't ever get into that terrible position. So, what makes a high-performing team? Well, we tend to use and we like the um, model pre presented by Patrick Lencioni where everything flows from a foundation of trust between your team members and then all layers being sufficiently supported um, before they can be um, before they're constructive that's not to say that one layer must be fully formed before you start the next layer um, but the five areas that Lencioni focuses on to that make a high performing team are trust constructive conflict commitment, accountability and results. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail and how that actually translates um, to the workplace and to um, how you can um, make your team more high performing. So the flip side of the high performing team is the dysfunctional team. This is the worst case scenario if everything has really gone disastrously wrong and deteriorated. However, what we've been finding with the teams that we're working in is that um, what's more likely to be happening is what we're terming as the functioning team. In other words, you've got the worst case scenario is the dysfunctional team. High performing team is what your the ultimate goal. 
but most teams and most organizations are somewhere in the middle um, and something something there is likely to be happening where, for example, if you've not got constructive conflict going on, in other words, people are able to challenge, there's that sort of artificial harmony where everything looks quite nice on the surface, but actually things are not quite as rosy as um, you'd like them to be. Um, and there's that people stepping around the... Um, uh, stepping around the difficult conversations. So how does that work? So perhaps you'll recognize this. Before the pandemic, um, it might have been in the norm for everybody to be in the office or in a centralized place of work most of the time. And then during the pandemic, a very sudden change and everybody working from home unless they absolutely had to be present um, and couldn't work remotely. So if you think back to that, um, situ those situations, you, your teams probably functioned in a way where you were able to use ways of working that catered for the majority. For example, if the majority of the people were in the office or in a central locations, meetings were held in person, and then those people who worked remotely were expected to be in the office on that day to attend the meeting. Similarly, the flip side of that when everything went remote. And I think Louise has got a perfect example of this. Um, yeah, so so I um, am currently working with um, an organisation um, quite local to here. And, um, th yeah, they've got a team that's pretty um, stable. You know, some of the team members have been there for 10, 15 years. Um, they're all used to being in the office together um, and um, so didn't really pay much attention to things like, you know, working out who was responsible for what. Um, because the managing director would quite often just walk into the office where everybody was and say, you know, we need this doing or can we sort that out? Or, you know, this new piece of business has come in. Can we can we manage that? Um, knowing that um, either somebody would, you know, pick it up and run with it or that they'd have a chat amongst themselves and say, OK, who's going to do what here? And then, of course, the pandemic hit. And wasn't it wasn't the, you know, the arrival of the pandemic and lockdown, an absolute classic case in, you know, um, necessity is the mother invention. And it gave us all a real, you know, we absolutely had to adapt to it. Things that we thought might be, you know, good, and uh, nice to have suddenly became absolutely essential. Um, and so, of course, all of this team were then remote. Um, and you can no longer have that, you know, walk into the room and say, I want this to happen. And so what was happening, um, you know, having had conversations with the managing director recently, he found that either things were being duplicated, which is inefficient, um, or things were still, things were actually being missed. And really critical bits of the business were just not happening because really he hadn't actually taken the time to um, talk to people and engage his team um in what should be happening in who is responsible for what um it's a, it, it's an absolute classic case of you know if you get all those things sorted when things are going well then they'll serve you well well when things perhaps go a bit badly wrong um but anyway it's, it's been a really good learning experience for him and, and i think they're going to be much better set up now than they were before great thanks louise so going from all in person to all remote probably now to something like this, hybrid working. So this seems to be the, the buzzword of the how things are going to be. And whereas the onus previously was on the individual who were the out, was the outlier and working differently from the rest of the team, now the onus is on the organisation to make it work. There might be no single clear location where everything happens. Um, and where everything e emanates. And this is going to require a change of mindset um, required by the leaders. How are you actually going to make it work? And has what's happened during the pandemic created a divide within the team, either stated or underlying? Um, and, you know, is that um, some cracks where um, difficulties could arise in the future? And there is an anticipation um, in the moment uh, sort of that, work will never return to how it was pre-pandemic. An overwhelming 77% of people see hybrid working as the most likely way forward. And 57% of employees expect to be in the office 10 days or less each month. And 98% of employees believe that meetings, all future meetings should be remote. Um, 
and include remote participants. Therefore, should online or virtual meetings be the norm, even if people are physically in the office? So um, please share in the chat how you and your team are expecting to work post, um, you know, now that we're emerging from the pandemic. What are you finding? Where are, you, where are your people going to be? Um, and how are you going to get the most out of them? Just to confirm what we mean by hybrid working, we we mean a sort of a team where you've got people working in different locations, some working remotely, other work, other people working centrally or in an office, or maybe a mixture of both. Um, but what does that actually mean in practice? So if you've got hybrid team workers who've got who can choose where they work anywhere at any time, how are you going to manage those people and how are you going to um, manage the differences in the team members circumstances for example your on-site employees will have to spend time commuting while remote workers will can focus um, and work more on the tasks and they'll have they'll be see be thought to have more time on their hands but in this case the latter may feel that they're working harder apologize the lawnmower is going outside the window um, <laughs> As a result, um, remote workers may feel that um, they are overworked and burn themselves out. Similarly, um, those who are remote working may feel that they have to work harder because their team leader cannot see them sitting at their desk. And, you know, what do those perceptions, possibly incorrect, are doing to the, to the dynamics within the team? And I don't know if... Um... Do you remember when um, we first started banning? And I must apologise also as well. I've got Brian the Builder drilling away in my bathroom upstairs. Um, do you remember the time when um, you know we, we we banned smoking from the workplace? Um, so if you wanted to smoke, you had to go outside and use um, the smoking shelter. And I remember hearing people saying, you know, this is not fair. Um, I'm not a smoker, so I don't get an extra 15 minutes to go out and have a cigarette. You know, what can I have a break for? And, and it's one of those classic, classic things, isn't it? That you know, if you have a great process in place or a great structure it, it's fine until you apply people and behaviors because of, of course you know as Kate has said people respond in different ways to things that they see being imposed upon them um, and and that drives a whole set of behaviors um, and uh, you know Lucy's um, made a really good point earlier about um, you know relationships based on trust and will that change the way teams work forever um, which we can come back to in a minute um, Kate, um, Lucy's also put some notes in the chat about um, the her experience of working and, and she used to stand outside with her smoking friends. <laughs> 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 She's put some really um, ideas there about, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the teams that she's she's um, working with um, and how they're approaching hybrid working. Shall I shall I bring that in now? Yes, that'd be great. Thanks, Louise. Yeah, so Lucy's basically saying she's working um, in a couple of projects. Um, one business has a presenteeism culture. Well, crikey, we, we could talk all morning about presenteeism oh, yes. and how damaging it can be because people think it's important for them to turn up regardless of you know how they're feeling and what else is going on in their lives. Um, and they want people back. And the other organisation would love to have people back, but understand reluctance. And two, are, two other organisations are working completely remotely. Um, and, and what I find particularly fascinating is I, I'd love to ask people how they arrived at that decision. You know, was it uh, a decision which was made by the by the person in charge? Was it something that the team were all engaged in? Um, and this is where, again, you know, you make a good point, Lucy, about trust. Um, you know, how much do people actually trust their teams to get on with the job when they are working remotely? Um, you know, and is it is there this view that if people are in the office, you can actually monitor what they're doing and therefore they're likely to be more productive? Is that still valid? Um, you know, we all saw the, the stuff in the news, didn't we, about um, civil servants are being told to get back to the office and particularly younger people because otherwise their careers will suffer. You know, how valid is that? Yeah. 
but similarly you know the, the the concept that everybody can work from work remotely i mean that really hasn't worked well for some people they haven't got the right space actually they really suffer from being you know shut away and not seeing anybody um so i i think there's a real um balance to be struck and it's it's organizations need to engage with their staff to um, and their teams to to really find out what's best for them because if they're not working in the best way for the teams then those people will will walk they will only put up with it for so long they will see something else and particularly at the moment where there are stories in the news of how many job vacancies there are if you're not finding the job it's not just the job it's the way of working that will i think will be important for people in the future to choose their jobs so pros and cons then just a few just to throw it out there there are real pros and cons from having from having for having a hybrid team um and you know better skilled employees you know do the people have to come from your locality um or can you actually um employ somebody with the right skill set from anywhere in the world um uh you might get a more diverse skill set you might get um better um better well-being greater work flexibility you might be able to reduce some of your organizational overheads um that greater control of your work-life balance i think people will um you know, there, there seems to be a real underswell of um, people who want to take more control of, you know, don't tell me what I can, what I can, where I can and can't work. If I'm doing the job and I'm doing a great job, does it matter if I'm in the office or at home, um, in my home office? Um, similarly, um, the, the cons might be that, you know, it's more difficult to communicate with each other, more difficult to distribute the information properly. Who's going to pick up the jobs? Is everyone on task? That fit perception of in inequity between the team members um, and, you know, making sure that there's no burnout and stress, um, that everybody is feeling suitably rewarded, um, working to the same level. And there's that separation between work and um work and home i had a nice um phrase that uh, somebody somebody used when i was when we were work all working from home he just said it's not like working from home it's just like living at work um and i i, I figured that that was um quite, i i really like that that really um tuned with me can you really shut the door and work um walk away from it or are you um you just that temptation just to oh just to go back and just send that last email and I wonder how many people actually learned during um, working from home um, when they weren't used to it. I mean, I'm, you know, Kate and I have been used to doing a lot of work from home over over the last few years. Um, so it's all set up to do that. Um, but particularly when schools closed um, and um, a lot of parents, predominantly mothers, were also trying to juggle schooling um, and childcare with running a business or with working from home. I wonder how many of how long it took some of them to realise that it's just almost impossible to do both. It increases pressure and stress. And then I think we kind of went through this bell curve, really, didn't we, where people then recognised we all have lives. As, as Kate says, you know, we live in the office, so we have lives which and sometimes those boundaries are blurred. Um, mm -hmm. I was having a call on Monday with a client who's um, whose young child was at home sick and he just kept climbing all over her and so she just kept getting up and walking around and you know still talking to me as she left the screen um and uh, you know we got we got the call done it took longer than it would have done um but you know it it's it's not ideal because it's you know it it does it diverts your time but it also diverts your mental energy because you're not entirely focused on on the work you're doing so um i think we're still very much in a state of flux about that but it has definitely thrown up some real issues around um you know what you're responsible for in your life apart from just your work yeah so if we go back to thinking about our high performing team and how we're going to make it um sort of how our hybrid team is high performing um and we go back to that model we think about that move from invulnerability to trust um and to build trust then colleagues must know each other better um, and the, those um, divides and perceived inequalities must be removed. Um, an opportunity to fail safely with a no blame culture, you know, can you own up to getting it wrong? So 
think about if there are divisions in the team between the experiences in of the pandemic. For example, have you got staff who were furloughed against those who were not, staff who worked remotely and those who had to work in person? What about those people who are new to the organisation or to, new to the team? Or what about those people who left the organisation without a proper send off or a goodbye? Um, and we've put together some suggested activities there, but um, you know that idea that you can get together in person or virtually um, and an opportunity to really catch up with each other um, and in the margins of the formal get together. So can you have a meet if you're having a meeting with everybody can you set it up in the, such a way that you have a breakout room um before you start so a bit like um you know if you arrive in the meeting room a bit early and you have a quick catch up with your colleagues while you're getting a coffee or you know um as you're arriving before everybody sort of settles into their seat and gets started you've got some examples as well haven't you of one um, not-for-profit organization we've been working with and the challenges they've had yeah absolutely and um it's you know and it does also very much play into lucy's earlier question about you know testing trust during lockdown and will this change teams forever well you know before lockdown when things were normal um you know did teams really trust each other did leaders trust their teams to do what they expected them to do um and how much has be, has working remotely and now um hybrid working really shone a spotlight on those issues around trust um, you know, do um, leaders expect their people to complete tasks in the way that they expect them to or in the time that they expect them to? Or do they trust them to get on with achieving the outputs and the outcomes that they expect from them without actually monitoring ev them every step of the way? So, yeah, there's huge issues around huge issues around trust. Um, the organisation which Kate and I have been working with and are still working with um, had actually already started to implement a round of redundancies before um, lockdown happened um, and it just got worse during lockdown this is a, is a really big um, a charity which which works a lot with young people um, and a lot of the people were employed by the charity had also volunteered for the charity so they were hugely invested in it emotionally um, and then suddenly to be told actually your 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 role is no longer required or you, or we restructuring so your role will change and um, so you'll have to compete for your own role um brought in even more issues around trust and feelings of being vulnerable um in a way that perhaps they weren't expecting and some of them also said you know that they they during lockdown had not heard at all from their managers you know that they were just expected to get on with their jobs remotely um and i mean not at all there had been no um you know no online meetings no catch-up calls no attempt to replicate what might be happening in the office um and of course all the perception was around is that because they don't care um is that because you know they're rubbish at this and actually i think some managers themselves just struggled to work out how their role would need to change when they were working remotely um, but certainly when, when, when the organisation, when we started working with them, um, with both people who were being made redundant and people who were then going to be part of the new organisation, there was a huge amount of suspicion. You know, am I going to be next? Why are they doing this? You know, why are they behaving like a private sector company? It was almost that sort of, but we're a charity and we help people and we do good and that's why we're here. So in a way, being part of a, a, a not for profit or a third sector organisation um, overlays an even bigger challenge on that in that people are, have such an emotional investment in it. So there was all the suspicion around it. There was all the lack of trust around, you know, why them, uh, you know, why will it be me next time? And if so, why? But also all that survivor guilt, um, you know, I, I so I've survived. But, you know, people I've known for many years because we're invested in this charity suddenly are out of work and it's really tough for them because they were made redundant or their roles were made redundant when we were in lockdown so there wasn't that sense of you know we're all in it together they still hadn't worked out how to get to that place where they they really felt they could support each other because they were also adapting to a different way of working um but you know and they're all coming back trying to work out a hybrid way of working now and it's it's uncomfortable like a lot of change it's very uncomfortable for them yeah so one of the you know one of the big things is creating opportunities for people to talk to each other and 
explain what's been going on and to get to know each other again. You know, a lot has happened. You may have been working next to each other um, for years before the before the um, pandemic, and yet you've never you've not seen them in person for eighteen months. We've got a we've got a, um, a um, we're working with a company in a uh, or an organisation in a couple of weeks where they haven't seen each other physically as a whole team for eighteen months. They've had conversations, they've seen each other on Zoom, but they haven't really had that chance to just catch up. How how are you? How is it for you? what's been going on so it'll be interesting to see so we'll we, we're building some time into that morning for some for some just some chats and to catch up yeah and we've got actually a really couple of good couple of really good points in the chat kate about um you know um, people communicating face to face or being in physical environment and and how that works but we'll, we'll come on to those in a minute yeah thank you so Moving then from an artificial harmony um, in your team to constructive conflict. Conflict is a is a it's a strange word. It's something that everybody um, sort of shies away from. It's quite it's quite uncomfortable. Um, but what we mean by conflict here, I suppose, is challenge. That idea that people can disagree with each other and it's not personal, No, not for personal point scoring. That whole idea that you can have a good debate with somebody um, and it's, doesn't turn, it isn't the same as an argument um, and it doesn't have to be um, a horrible thing. In, any, in many ways, it's exactly what should be happening for organisations and high performing teams. You want people to have a good debate. You end up with better decisions, better, um, better challenge, People feel that they've had their points heard. It's they've had a chance to say their piece. But as in a high performing team, that has to be managed because you, what you want to make sure is that it is an opportunity for everybody to say what they what they believe to be true, particularly for decisions that are big decisions um, um, within the organisation. But um, it's a way of getting everybody engaged as well. So. Team members who operate in a um, climate of trust and psychological safety, so you have to have built that trust first, is somewhere where they can challenge each other and disagree with each other um, and make better decisions and get better overall results. How many times have you sat in that bland meeting, really, really boring, where nobody's challenged anything, everybody's just nodded in agreement? and actually you just wonder why you're there and really are the decisions that are being made um good decisions or um you know really um actually uh, having spoken up in the meeting and challenged in the meeting would have led to a much better outcome and disengagement and costly um is spreads wider than just in um sorry, disengagement is really costly and spreads wider than just in meetings. So it start, tends to start in meetings, but people who are disengaged are much more likely to be absent, much more likely to have accidents and much more likely to make errors, 60% more likely to make errors, 37% um, higher absenteeism. So if you've got all people that really feel that their points are heard, that they can engage in debate, um, that they don't just have to be the yes person, then you are likely to have um, better productivity, better profitability and lower numbers of people who leave the organisation. So um, therefore, you're going to have to recruit less often um, and you've got um, better productivity from those staff that you've got. And some, some of the suggestive activities. So Louise and I work really um, a lot with teams to understand, that, um, help them to gain their self-awareness. So their individual and their collective co conflict profiles um, so that they understand um, what happens to them when they are in those situations which are stressful. Um, but also to understand how to have good debates and having good debates and good discussions takes practice. Um, you have to encourage that. Um, and the meeting chairs need, need to be able to facilitate healthy discussions and create opportunities for everybody to participate. 
And it's really interesting, isn't it, that the um, uh, there is this view that um, you have to be an expert in the subject that, uh, that you're dealing with to be able to contribute constructively to that debate. Um, but, you know, change, change is coming on that subject. There's a lot of different views on that now. Um, and um, certainly I've, um, I, in, in my previous career as, a, as an RAF officer, um, because I was in learning and development, everywhere I went, I was having to learn a different language and a different um, set of uh, different terminologies, different way of working. Um, but you bring a you know perspective to them, um, you know which which perhaps they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and I don't know if any of you have um, come across Matthew Syed and his book um, Rebel Ideas. There's some really good stuff in there. Um, for example, you know he set up a an advisory group to the football association, and not one of the people in the group. Is actually a footballer. Um, there's, there's Matthew Syed, who is um, well, was previously a table tennis champion. Uh, there's Lucy Giles, who's uh, an, an army officer who's done a lot of work in the Army Leadership Centre. Um, Stuart Lancaster, who is the coach of the England rugby team, and so on and so forth. And the point being that they bring different perspectives, um, and they have that debate because they challenge from a very valid perspective, but one that doesn't necessarily align with the, the the group that they're working with um we want to avoid groupthink don't we and and i was conscious when kate was talking about people who sit in meetings just nodding politely i'm sitting there nodding politely it's not because i'm bored kate. it's not because i'm bored or disagreeing with what you say but you know we, we've been there i mean i've been in meetings where we come out and they and people immediately start well i don't agree with that what a load of rubbish that was you know why didn't you say so in the meeting well quite often it's because People don't want conflict, they don't want confrontation, and they don't want to suffer the penalty of having spoken out. I mean, I do know people have been sacked for doing that or managed out of a business because they disagreed with the boss. So really, really important to understand what it is that, um, you know, how you can contribute to that and what perspectives you can bring. But also it comes back to this point about trust, doesn't it? Um, if you don't feel psychologically safe and if you don't feel that you can offer an alternative perspective and you keep doing that so the team remains diverse and you sustain that we're never going to get those rich decisions we're never going to get those great outcomes yes and i was just thinking as you were speaking there as well louise that in a hybrid team and particularly you know where everybody you've, you're holding meetings online um or virtually it's really hard to have a discussion because the reality is that if you're in a room having a discussion that people do kind of speak across each other and um they don't sit politely and wait for their turn and in a in a um, in a virtual meeting, it's really hard to do that because the only one person can speak at once on, particularly on Zoom, only one speaker um, can be heard. So can you create those opportunities? So those little breakout rooms, um, little breakout rooms, go and go and discuss that. Go and make, does the decision need to be made in the meeting today? Or can you get together in your huddle and kind of come to, come back together having had the discussion so that you really bring the best of the diversity of thinking to your um, to your decision making and to your um, and to the debate? Hmm. So moving from ambiguity to um, commitment. And what do I mean by commitment? Well, um, it's that um, really being bought into the um, bought into the organisation and what the organisation is trying to achieve, um, and to be um, to be committed to the cause, you have to know what you're buying into, what you, what you've. Um, so there needs to be real clarity, and for people to be clear about what they are buying into, you need to make sure that you don't make any assumptions or um, and that there any ambiguity. You know, at the end of the discussions, hopefully the healthy ones, um, make sure there's clarity about what's been decided upon. What was the agreement? So that even if people don't necessarily agree with the decision that was made, they know what the decision is. They did have a chance to air their opinion. Um, but now they kind of go, yeah, OK, I, you know, I know what what we've gone bought into here and I can move on and work with that. So, and it's part of having a clearly defined and communicated visions and goals, which everybody knows and everybody knows their part. 
um, and understands them, not just knows them and has them written on the wall. What are you there to do? What's your, what's your purpose? So some suggested activities which work well, regardless of how your teams are working together. Make sure the key decisions have been discussed and everybody's had a chance. Ha go back and discuss what the team or the organization's visions and goals. Does everybody really understand what they're there to do and what the decision, the vision and goals mean for them and their role? Have you had an opportunity recently as a team to um, share each other's job spec? What does everybody do? What are they there to do? What are their main tasks? What are their challenges? How do they feel that their job fits into achieving the overall team goals? And Louise, I think you've been working, you've been particularly working with an organisation that's got a, you've got a really great example of this, I know. Yeah, again, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a big organisation. It's a charity. Um, it's grown massively over the last uh, 18 months. Um, it's um, been in a bit of a perfect storm, really. Um, it's been quite considerably impacted by Brexit. Um, it also um, recruited, it had to recruit a lot of new people, including a lot of new directors, because it won a massive, massive contract to deliver um, some government um, services. So it grew quite massively um, and the, the leadership team is now nine. Um, they don't, uh, when I started working with them um, earlier this year, they'd never actually met each other. They'd never been in the same space. They'd all been brought in quite rapidly. Um, and so the storming phase of the, you know, setting up the team um, was still in, in progress. Um, they hadn't actually been able to, to get together to start to think about, um, you know, who was doing what. Um, so they had no time. You know what it's like when you when you um, when you're a senior leader in an organisation, um, you love all that time. You know, in that sort of you know the, the brain space just to sit around and you know work about you know work out your strategic vision and your and your goals. But then you you constantly drag back into um, into firefighting and, and dealing with business as usual. Um, what what a boss of mine used to call the urgent driving out the important. Um, but we did a session with them uh, a couple of months ago and we started the session with, you know, let us agree what is our shared sense of purpose here? What are you actually here to do? Um, thinking that they would get to that point really quickly. It took about four hours of really, really hard work, hard intellectual effort to get them to agree, to come up with some ideas and then to agree what was their sense of purpose? What were they actually all committing to? And we had to get to that point before they could even start to think about who was individually responsible for what and how did they agree all of that. And there was a point during one session where one of the directors said, well, I've, I've done this. I've produced a strategy for this. And I just said, OK, who else has seen that strategy? And none of the other eight people in the room had seen it. So and this is in a small leadership team um, who are in the same office They, you know, they're still not at that place yet where they are all aligned behind this commitment to a shared sense of purpose. And they're all really clear about who does what, because they're sharing those ideas and different perspectives. So yeah, fascinating, fascinating to see how they'll get on now. So they're all very busy, but are they actually busy doing the right thing? Yeah, I love your story about the, what is it, the, the med tech widget packer? Oh yes, yeah. so I read it <clears throat> in one of the books I was reading that there, there was a lady who was working um, as um, she she packed widgets for um, a med tech company. So she had spent years packing this um, packing widgets and sort of had, you know, got on with her job and did her job well to the best of her ability, but had never really thought about what what she was really doing until one day, unfortunately, she was um, diagnosed with um, needed an MRI scan um, and was lying in the MRI machine and looked up and saw the um, the label of the um, the organ of uh, the machine, the MRI machine, and realised that that was the company that she packed widgets for. So as she was lying in the MRI machine, um, waiting for some dreadful diagnosis, she was there and realised that her packing widgets was saving her life and lives of people like it, like her. So you know all of a sudden sharing in that meeting you know what are you there to do um i'm there to pack widgets 
which save people, which create machines to save people's lives like mine. I just love that. It just brings a tear to my eye every time. So <laughs> I need um, to love it as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a really nice story. So what is, you know, you're there filling in your spreadsheet. What are you actually there to do? What is the what is your contribution to the bigger aim of your um, organization, to your charity, to your to your um, to the purpose? Um, a move from acceptance of mediocrity to accountability. So that building that culture of peer accountability, peer to peer accountability. So it's not just the boss telling you what to do. So a culture where peers can give constructive feedback and hold each other, not just for their results and what they're doing, but also their behavior. And if uh, um, clear lines of, uh, you know, if clear lines of behavior are crossed, um, then they're caught, people are called out. So, um, I was thinking about what, how that might look, um, and what what might be what we what you could do to help that. So, being accountable is very often saying out loud what you're doing and what you're aiming to do, what your priorities are, what what's 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 your main effort for that week, what's in your what's in the top of your in tray. So, how often do you spend at the beginning of a meeting if you have a regular team meeting? Quick round the round the room. What's the top three things, top three priorities in everybody's in tray? Doesn't have to be long, but saying it out loud means that everybody knows where your priorities are, and it's a good good way of um, checking up on. Uh, you know, it, hang on a minute, you're doing that. I thought I was doing that, so it's a great great chance to do that. Have you got goals um, and? Are you keeping clear progress of those tasks? Not the huge goals, but just the data, you know, the, the smaller tasks that you know need to be done that um, aim towards the bigger goals. And can you catch anywhere where you're, you know, there are shortcomings or you're 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 sort of not quite on track? Good way of sort of keeping people accountable, but also if you need to redirect some effort from one, you know, one person, you know, give another person to help out. Um, and one of the things about um, sort of giving constructive feedback and holding each other to account is it's sometimes really hard. Um, and very often people like to receive um, and give feedback in different ways. Um, do you know how um the people in your team like to receive praise. How do they best respond um, to um, being given praise or reward? But also, how do they respond best um, if you're giving them feedback and want to uh, want to call out some of their behaviour or question what they're doing? And um, I I was thinking of a situation where um, it's really much easier to call out. Um, or hold people to account for results rather than their behaviour. And I was thinking of a, a situation, you may remember this, Louise, um, where we were working in the same team and there was a senior, um, there was one day there was, a, I, we weren't in the office, there was, a, but other people were in the office and a senior team member was sitting in the office doing their tax return during work time. There was loads of work to be done and deadlines to meet. And it was one of the more junior team members who noticed this, but just couldn't, didn't know how to call out the fact that really, you're sitting there doing your tax return and you you know there's loads of work to be done and they just didn't know how to they just didn't have the confidence they didn't know how to to deal with that but the knock on effect in that was that there was an erosion of respect there was resentment and so on and so forth but if that person had had the tools and the um had had felt more confident um and maybe had um sort of um, had more opportunity to practice that, then they might have felt, um, you know, sort of um, more able to call out that behaviour. But it was really detrimental to the team because, it, you know, it eroded all sorts of trust and um, um, <laughs> respect. I remember it well, and I, and I, do remember, I remember the same interview because, unfortunately, his lack of confidence and, and leadership capability manifested itself in quite an aggressive approach um, to people like me and Kate. 
um, and saying things like, I am in charge around here, you know, um, which of course we just, um, we, you know, we didn't snigger behind our hands or anything like that, but it was, you know, it was, that was the kind of behavior that we saw exhibited. And, and actually it's, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, Anita's just put a comment on about vulnerability. Um, and it is about being able to, you know, having that safe space where if you, particularly if you're in a leadership position, you can share those feelings of vulnerability and say, actually, I don't have the answer to this. And, and it's really keeping me awake at night. You know, what do I do? How can I be better without thinking people go, well, people will think you look weak or somehow you're not up to it. You're not capable yeah so i mean i was just thinking there about how it um in a hybrid team you know how do you hold people account uh, accountable for um and you know where there's going to have to be some sort of understanding of you know if people are working in different ways and in different locations what what is acceptable what are the what are the rules what's the expectation um so, for example, do you have to be, you know, if if I'm working my hours, does it mean that I have to be sitting at my desk from nine till 12 and then half past 12 till half past four? So, um, you know, is that is that fine? Or if I do my, you know, if I do my hours and I'm here, you know, and I sort of do a bit at the beginning, take the children to school, then do a bit later on. I've got to go and pick the kids up. But I then I. Um, um, I then log on in the evening. Does that matter? Um, how are you going to hold people to accountable? Is it going to be easier to hold people accountable for their outputs rather than their, you know, comes back to that concept of presenteeism? You know, it's a it's a conversation that needs to happen. And that's all part of that building trust. So if you you've had the conversation with everybody in the team, can you make it work um you know so everybody understands what what's acceptable and what what is where are the lines mm -hmm. so at the top of our high performing team we had um achieving outstanding results so um and in in our functioning team there's that the concept of ego and status and self interest so to achieve the results so, um, you know, everybody would say, you know, a team is there to achieve something um, in particular. They've got a, a goal that they're there to, do, you know, achieve. They're, they're things that they've got to do. So you're starting to achieve success in your team and you've got the results. What, you know, how do you know you're going to, you know, what is it precisely you're trying to achieve and how are you going to measure it? And how are you going to reward the people who have achieved those results? Is it a team result or is it an individual achievement? So who gets the praise? So, for example, is it the team leader who's achieved the team and therefore gets the bonus or the um, the accolade from the senior leadership team? What's how does it work? Um, and so consider in your team and your organisation how um about the sort of personal reward and recognition structures. How do you make sure that people are equally rewarded regardless of where and how they're working? Um, how do people like to be recognised for their contribution to team efforts? So, for example, if you've, un if you've got, um, you've done some um, personal behaviours profiling, um, maybe you've done something like Myers-Briggs, there are very clear, um, you know, different ways that people like to be recognised. Um, and um, clear communication about the team or the organisational goals and how their success will be measured. Um, have you got anything that you would like to say on that, Lou? Um, only that, um, you know, if you are um, managing volunteers, um, you need to think oh, yes really hard about how you actually reward them if you can't um you know if, if you can't reward them financially um, and and actually that isn't actually the, the greatest amount of the greatest reward for people who are paid employees um for certainly younger generations it's about you know having a, a meaningful job of work and, and finding some meaning in the workplace um but i i also um, am a chair of trustees um, of an organization um and so you know have to manage volunteers um, and try without being able to performance manage them, but have to work out what constitutes reward for them uh, and how to, you know, enable them to 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 give their best and to do the best job they can without those standard levers 
um, of reward which um, employees in, a, in an organisation will have. Yeah, so if in your hybrid team you're having to manage a combination of employees and um, volunteers, that that's you know it comes back to knowing your people and the trust within that um, within that team. So you know how will they respond respond best? So we've kind of done a canter through the whole you know sort of looked at every level of the sort of the Lencioni model, um, but just to kind of pull together some some of the ideas of. Um, and the, I suppose our sort of top tips on one slide for what you can do to improve the performance in hybrid teams. That doesn't matter whether that's a team you're working in, whether that's a team you're leading, or whether or not it, um, whatever the, the the concept of that team. And these tips work, I think, regardless of how people are working, whether they're completely present, completely re remote, or that hybrid. So. Make more time for people. Um, make time for people to get to know each other. Encourage that social chat. You know, we talked about the uh, mentioned the um, if you're having a, a meet a virtual meeting, have you got an opportunity to set up set up some little breakout rooms before you start the meeting so that that chat while you're making the coffee. Um, some the huge number of tools available to increase self awareness, um, but. In, done in the context of holding up the mirror. So what does what does my behaviour mean for the, those people who work with me or actually helpfully who live with me? And if you're living at work, then that that's also equally important. And, you know, can you share the elements of the diagnostics in in a way that is safe and helpful um, and doesn't um, doesn't create other other divisions and you know louise and i have worked a huge amount with organizations doing some of those diagnostic tools and and building bespoke diagnostics to help people increase their awareness and we've done them with each other and our team so uh, yes absolutely <laughs> we know too much <laughs> i can't fall out with you now um so improving the communication skills improving communication strategies and skills so very often what what we've seen is people very much focus on you know chairing a meeting or giving a presentation but actually it's more than that what about those skills around active listening what about those skills about um, having difficult or uncomfortable conversations about making constructive challenges and giving feedback and running better meetings. I've, I've sit, sat too many uh, through too many appalling meetings to count. Um, does everybody really know what they're there to do and how they fit in? So they're well communicated and clear and bought into organisational visions and goals, clear of job objectives and job specifications, and you know new members of staff good onboarding and induction packages introducing people to the team so that they um so that they that they feel part of the team and they fit in from the from the get go is there anything else that i've forgotten louise invariably there is well i don't i know you absolutely haven't but uh, there's some really great statements and questions in the chat so should i go through those and that might tease out some other things brilliant and, uh, well I'll stop oh, I'll I'll just give you my the last piece. Please connect with us, and um, we'll have a. Um, and then, if I stop sharing my screen, I can actually see the chat, which should be which should be great, <laughs> and I can see everybody's face then. So that'll be fantastic. Thank um, you. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, Lucy made a really good point earlier on about um, you know the impact on early careers of hybrid working. Um, you know, when you learn so much at an early stage about you know when you're just in an office and you pick stuff up. You know, when you're um, when you're surrounded by people. Um, and you just hear conversations and it's it's that, as I described it, that sort of learning by osmosis, um, you know, that experiential learning, which you can't do if you're not in an office. So how do you maximise that in a hybrid team? How do you maximise that when you are in the office together? Do you create those opportunities for those? I mean, I don't like the term water cooler moments, but it's those kind of sidebar chats, the informal chats, you know, they, where you soak up all that lovely experience and, and knowledge. Um, yeah, I need to put a, a really, uh, you know, a concern in there, which I think a lot of us have come across um, concerned about my network. Um, you know, burnout seems more of a threat than a year ago. Um, certainly my experience um, of, of, is with colleagues and, you know, some of the volunteers that I, I look after as well. Um, those who are not particularly resilient, um, who e get easily overwhelmed, 
are more um, easily overwhelmed during lockdown. Um, and if they're not, if they don't have that safe space in which they can share concerns, share vulnerabilities. Um, uh, Sean, yes, I work in sales and I don't feel that proper conversations happen across the screen. What about people who thrive off or achieve more through interacting with others face to face? Very much so. I'm in chairing a meeting of trustees when there are 24 people, most of whom are not on the screen at the same time. Incredibly yeah. difficult. Um, and you can read the room, can't you, when you're in the same space? Yeah, really difficult. Um, I, I'm i somebody who really needs to be in the same physical space to to, to feel that I'm, you know, to, to get that energy and to get that really feel that I'm building that rapport. Um, I don't know what I've got better at it. I practice, but it's just not the same. And I'm not I'm not quite sure what the answer is, Sean. If anybody else has got the, the magic, um, the magic answer, you, you're, you're worth a fortune. <laughs> And I think there are some people out there who, you know, we've all had to adapt to it. Um, uh, you know, I and I, I did say, you know, you know the, the, the stuff we did for our booth. Um, if, if you're if you're running a meeting or you're running a session and someone's wearing glasses, sometimes you can see what's on their screen. Kate, <laughs> are you doing yeah. are you checking on your Facebook profile? No, not <laughs> not at the moment. No, <laughs> um, not even on Twitter. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. I think so many of us do thrive through interacting with others face to face. You know, not all the time. And I'm massively introverted in personality terms. You know, I really don't want people around me all the time, but I have to have some means of being in the same space as people. Yeah. Um, you just go anywhere for a crowd, won't you, Kate? Yeah, I love it. I, I, I'll take my lap. It really killed me when I couldn't take my laptop to the coffee shop. And I don't need to be part of the conversation. I just needed it and needed something going on around me. It, you know, it would it was it was a real killer for me. Um yeah, Anita's mentioned imposter syndrome. Ah, we could we could spend it all day talking about imposter syndrome uh, and what you do with it. Um, I work with, um, um, I'm doing some action learning sets at the moment with business leaders who, and that for them is a safe space where they can, you know, there's there's no competition in the room. They can bring along a challenge and say, I don't actually know, I can't even describe this challenge. I just know that this is how I'm feeling. Meh. Um, and people just really, you know, they they get involved and they ask questions about it and they offer suggestions. and. I think that is so important that we have that safe space, isn't it, where we can go, I'm having a bit of a wobble about this. I don't really know if I'm up to this and I'm worried about being caught out. We've got to be kind to ourselves. And as you say, Anita, you know, no one has our particular skill set um, mm -hmm. and set of qualities. Um, yes. And some and, and another really, really great point that, you know, I'm also someone who's up at five o'clock in the morning and gets my best work done then. But please don't try and have a nice chat with me. Um, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not particularly sociable at that time, um, you know, and um, Lucy's, you know, you wouldn't get much sense from me. Um, no, not a, not, a, not a chance. <laughs> Louise knows that. I, do, I, I, I don't do mornings. I need to have had at least three cups of tea. And, uh, and um, but I'm, you know, quite happy at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> You're a night owl. Oh, it's so funny, isn't it, how we all work in such different ways and actually if i am working at five o'clock in the morning then i quite like it the reason i'm working and i'm productive then is the emails not pinging so i'm thinking no don't email me at five o'clock in the morning this is what i'm doing the good stuff yeah. um but it, it's just working with your brain and i think this way of hybrid working is brilliant because it is allowing people to do that um yeah. but i think there's a lot of people that feel guilty if they're not seen to be on screen or connected via teams or something throughout the day and I think that it's all about trust throughout yeah. the organization that you need to trust your teams and you need to get, look they're brilliant at what they do that's why you recruited them and you need to kind of let them get on with it a bit um, and, and I think that's where a lot of people are struggling at the moment where they feel like perhaps they're not doing enough or not to be seen to be doing enough because they're not in front of people it's such a tough one isn't it it's such a tough one and I think we're all absolutely shattered now because it's been a little bit relentless hasn't it dealing with the highs and lows so yeah. at first I think we were slightly shell-shocked okay we've got to find a way so we found a way we innovated we did all these brilliant things and now we're kind of muddling through through, aren't we with what's going to happen next hopefully this is it and um, we are 
cracking ahead, but you just don't know. We don't know what's going to happen next, but this is here to stay now. I don't think hybrid working is going away. The, the mm -hmm. everybody being in the office um, at the same time is, is not going to be the thing. We've got lots of A teams and B teams at the moment um, from conversations I'm having, and uh, we need to to gel everyone together. So ladies, thank you. Um, this morning's presentation has been brilliant. I know there's lots of tips. We're going to be sharing this for people um, who haven't been able to watch the whole session um, on YouTube and we'll be sharing it on our feeds. So thank you. Please do connect with both Kate and Louise. Um, there are speaker profiles within Hopin um, that click through to LinkedIn. So please connect with them both and visit their website as well. And um, we will see you soon, ladies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely Thank to see you. Lisa. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Sean, for your great ideas and comments. Yeah. And, well, it's brilliant. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.